1951, politicians seemed firmly within the Mafia's grasp. By 1957, the Mafia had grown weary of the Eisenhower-Nixon administration. Their shift in support towards the Kennedy administration in 1960 marked yet another significant twist. Kennedy, employing tactics reminiscent of FDR's methods, embarked on confronting a different societal menace, echoing historical patterns of political manoeuvring. In March 1951, Frank Costello's clash with the Kefauver hearings garnered significant coverage in Time magazine. Here is the article that Costello, Luciano, Gambino, Genovese, Accardo, Traficante Jr., Tommy L., Joe Bonanno, Stefano Magadino, Russell Buffalino, Paul Rica, and many others, including your average day-to-day -day American worker, would have read. The Kefauver committee men rolled into the nation's largest city last week for the big finale to their investigation of organized crime in the U.S. Before they were done, they had made the legendary Frank Costello squirm in view of millions of television watchers and provided titillating evidence that unobtrusive Frank Costello was just what they had claimed, the boss of one of the nation's two big crime syndicates. They had also charted some tortuous trails that led straight out of Costello's underworld and wound up in ex-Mayor William O'Dwyer's anteroom. The dignified law chambers of Foley Square had never seen anything like it, even during the dramatic trials of Alger Hiss or the Communist Party hierarchy. Curious spectators stood for hours in pushing lines for seats. To the small upstairs room, finally forced the committee to move down to a big third-floor courtroom. Their flashbulbs flared like heat lightning through the forest of television and newsreel cameras. From the judge's bench, mild-mannered Estes Kifova presided with a firm hand as Chief Counsel Rudolf Halley, an able, professionally annoying examiner, hammered at the unhappy witnesses. At Kefauver's right sat Maryland's judicial-mannered Herbert O'Connor, Wyoming's Lester Hunt, and New Hampshire's pious old Charles Toby, no lawyer, who glared with Yankee outrage at uneasy officials and sullen thugs, burst out at intervals to denounce the sinners, once with such eloquence that he moved himself to tears. The Groundwork Counsel Halley had carefully laid the groundwork for his case against Frank Costello. First he called in a grey, glib Manhattan lawyer named George Morton Levy, who runs Long Island's Roosevelt Raceway. Witness Levy admitted unabashedly that he regularly played golf with Costello, bookmaker Frank Erickson, and an internal revenue agent named Schoenbaum, and under Halley's persistent prodding, told a tale of Costello, the boss of bookies. Levy testified that in 1946, the New York Racing Commissioner threatened to revoke the track's license if he did not get rid of the bookmakers who were operating there. Levy instantly thought of his golfing friend Costello and hired him to keep gamblers away from the track. He paid him $15,000 a year for four years. Overnight, the bookmakers magically disappeared. Then a garrulous, emaciated Republican politician named Charles Lipsky, who announced himself as a good friend of O'Dwyer's, added some illuminating details about Costello the boss politician. Demanded Chief Counsel Rudolf Halley, Based on your years of experience in politics in this city, did you believe it was necessary to get Costello's backing for your candidate? Said Lipsky. I did that. That's why I went to see him. Two secondary villains, Joe Adonis, a sleek and handsomely sullen hood, and burly bookmaker Frank Erickson glowered briefly at the committee, answered no important questions, and departed, Adonis to his comfortable home in New Jersey, Erickson to his jail cell, where he is serving two years for bookmaking. The stage was set for the leading, heaviest part of the piece, Costello on the offensive. Next day, in walked well-tailored Frankie Costello himself, looking arrogantly down his commanding nose, Television cameras followed his deliberate progress to the stand. The committee members craned and nervously shuffled some papers. Spectators peered and murmured under the beating lights. Costello at once took the offensive. Through his lawyer, George Wolfe, he protested the television cameras. Mr. Costello doesn't care to submit himself as a spectacle, Wolfe declared loftily. 
Anxious not to lose their star, the committee agreed that Costello's face should not be televised. Costello coolly set out to explain his deal with lawyer Levy. I says, what way can I help you? I say, well, what I can do, George, I can spread the propaganda around that they are hurting you there, and you are a nice fellow, and I can tell them that if there is an arrest made, it is going to be very severe. I do not know how well it is going to do you, but I will talk about it. Halley. Who did you talk to about it? Costello. Anybody that was around a saloon or a bar, at Dinty Moors or Gallagher's, at the Waldorf, anywhere I had lunch, at the colony. Halley. What did you do in 1946 to earn $15,000? Costello. Practically nothing. I don't think I did a damn thing. Costello's Income Costello never seemed to have any difficulty getting money from associates. When he wanted $25,000, he could get it from Frank Erickson without hesitation. He endorsed a note for $325,000 for his New Orleans partner, Dandy Phil Castell. That was just accommodation, said Costello, pure friendship, in a deal to buy into the Whiteley distilleries, makers of King's Ransom Scotch but insisted he had gotten absolutely nothing out of it. The committee pursued him doggedly on his income. He admitted he got an $18,000 a year salary from the Beverly Club outside New Orleans as a goodwill man. He had a sort of little strong box at home where he kept a little cash, but could not remember how much. When his memory still refused to cooperate, Toby tartly suggested that one way of finding out was to send someone up to look. Costello abruptly remembered that he had about $50,000 or so in the box, another $90,000 to $100,000 in his bank account. Costello on the defensive. Boss, Costello was beginning to lose some of his earlier confidence. His voice rasped more hoarsely. He mopped his brow more and more often. Halley produced Costello's 1925 naturalization papers noted that he had failed to state he had once used the name Frank Severio, and that he had denied he had been in the bootlegging business. At that, Halley whipped out Costello's testimony to the State Liquor Authority in 1947, admitting he had bootlegged from 1923 to 1926. Said Costello sulkily, I didn't sell any liquor prior to 25. I might have expressed it the wrong way. But now, to my recollection, thinking it over observed Senator Toby. Is not the man who made the false affidavit susceptible to deportation? Costello winced, and his voice got suddenly hoarser. Said Toby, I will talk to you later. Then Halley threw another harpoon. Innocently, he asked Costello if he had ever paid anybody to check his telephone for wiretapping. Absolutely not, said Costello. A matter of perjury. A heavy-set, greying man named James McLaughlin took the stand. He testified that he used to work for the telephone company, that in 1945 Costello asked him to check his telephone. Two or three times a week, for about three months, he checked Costello's phone, and Costello handed him $50 or $100 when he saw him outside the Waldorf Astoria barbershop. He had arranged a code with Costello. When Costello's line was tapped, I would call him at his apartment and just say, This is Jim. Everything isn't well. Or words to that effect. When it was not tapped, I would say, Jim, I'm feeling fine today. The committee had caught Costello in a clear case of perjury. Next day, Costello came back to the courtroom, looking ruffled, shrunken and malevolent. His throat was inflamed, the television lights bothered him, and he was in no condition to testify further, his lawyer declared. Mild-mannered but firm, Kefava insisted he should try to answer a few questions. Rasped Costello I want to testify truthfully, and my mind doesn't function. With all due respect for the senators, I have an awful lot of respect for them. I am not going to answer another question. I am going to walk out. And walk he did, with the threat of contempt ringing in his ears. Next day he was back honking into his handkerchief, 
while Lawyer Wolf flourished a doctor's certificate. I refuse to go further with the questioning until I feel fully well and capable, Costello croaked, and walked out again. But Costello was nearer to prison than he had been since the day in 1915, when he was caught carrying a pistol. He faced a perjury charge, contempt of Congress, and he might be subject to deportation as well. In three short days, Frank Costello could see the destruction of the power and the respectable veneer he had been 35 years a building. Spotlight on Saratoga Springs. While Costello considered the consequences of his walkout, the committee turned its spotlight briefly on Saratoga Springs, just 30 miles from Governor Tom Dewey's capital at Albany. Saratoga detective Walter Ahern gulped, squirmed, and liked to have swallowed his gum under Senator Toby's outraged questioning, as he admitted that he regularly escorted the night's cash from the downtown bank to two gambling clubs. He got dollars a day for this service, he said, from the Piping Rock Club, where Costello used to own a piece, and fifty dollars a week from the Arrowhead Inn, where Maya Lansky, Joe Adonis, and Detroit's Lefty Clark run the tables. Superintendent of State Police John A. Gaffney admitted that he had bottled up a report on Saratoga's wide-open gambling, but pleaded it was contrary to policy to take action in cities. Toby exploded like a rusty pinwheel. You did nothing. You were a cipher, a zero, he roared. If I were the governor of this state, I would give you just five minutes to get out of the place, or I would kick you out, mumbled Gaffney humbly. I am glad you aren't the governor. The Story of Virginia Hill Council Halley had one more diversion before he went back to the main theme. In flung Virginia Hill, queen of the gangster's moles. She was soigneur in a platinum mink stole and picture hat. She was also cursing the photographers. Make them stop doing that. I'll throw something at them in a minute, she told Kefauver angrily. Then, while the senators listened breathlessly, Virginia told her simple tale of how a 17-year-old waitress from Alabama met a friend of big-time bookies named Joe Epstein and started along the road to fame and riches. Virginia, who is now 34 and married to a Sun Valley ski instructor, admitted knowing just about every nobleman in big crime's hierarchy, Joe Adonis, Costello, Maya Lansky, Charles Fischetti. But she did not admit much more. Lolling negligently at the witness table, Virginia explained her unlimited income in short bursts of Alabama drawl. I went with fellows. Like a lot of girls they got, giving me things and bought me everything I wanted. Whatever I ever had outside of betting on the horses was given to me. With no apparent embarrassment, she explained her breakup with her longtime friend, Ben Siegel, who was killed in the house he had rented for her in Beverly Hills. I had a big fight with him because I hit a girl in the Flamingo, and he told me I wasn't a lady. I had been drinking and I left, and I went to Paris when I was mad. With her long acquaintance with all these racketeers, didn't she ever hear about their businesses? When they talked business, she left the room, she said. At Siegel's Flamingo Club in Las Vegas, lots of time people didn't even know I was there. I was upstairs in my room, I did not even go out. I was allergic to cactus, thing. You just asked, didn't Halley? Want to know any, said Virginia. No, sir. I didn't want to know anything about anybody. With that, she shrugged her mink stole higher on her shoulders, ran a gauntlet of photographers, paused to shout, You goddamn bastards! I hope an atom bomb falls on all of you. Near the door, she slapped a woman reporter for good measure. Even for Ginny, it was quite an exit. The senators, a bit flustered, had learned exactly nothing about her suspected role as bank courier for the overlords of U.S. crime. Halley turned back to the shadowy connections between New York's politicos and New York's bosses of crime. Costello had walked out before the senators could grill him on his relations to Tammany politics. But they could explore Tammany politicians and the men around Mayor O'Dwyer for traces of the underworld's power. While O'Dwyer himself flew into town from the embassy in Mexico to testify, 
the committee hustled a whole covey of O'Dwyer's political friends and underlings on stage. An assistant state's attorney general testified that he had often seen O'Dwyer in Joe Adonis's Brooklyn restaurant in the 30s, along with other politicians. He thought it might have been O'Dwyer who introduced him to Adonis. A county prosecutor estimated that police protection in Brooklyn amounted to about $250,000 a bookmaker. Moron. The right bower. But the key man was big, beefy James J. Moran, a jaunty, florid Irish politician type. Once a court clerk, Moran had long been William O'Dwyer's political right bower. As O'Dwyer rose, so did Moran. When O'Dwyer became mayor, he made Moran first deputy fire commissioner, and let it be known that all things political were to be cleared with Jim Moran. As a last act, the departing mayor had appointed him to his lifetime $15,000 a year job as a city water commissioner. Moran was bluff and confident. He testified readily that he arranged a meeting for O'Dwyer with Costello in 1942 or 1943. O'Dwyer was in the army at the time and was investigating a rumour that Costello was mixed up with some people who were making trouble for the army at Wright Field. Moran knew just how to get hold of Costello. He called Michael Kennedy, then leader of Tammany Hall. Two weeks later, O'Dwyer went to Costello's apartment with Moran and stayed an hour. Moran did not know what they were talking about. Moran and the policy king. After that, Moran met Costello often in restaurants and, as Costello had testified, frequently dropped in for a drink at his apartment. Did Moran know a racketeer called Lewis Weber, one-time policy king of Brooklyn? He did. Weber had been around politics for years, he explained. Halley. Was he also a frequent visitor at your office when you were deputy fire commissioner? Moran. It is possible that Weber came in my office three times during that period. Halley. Is it possible he came much more often? Moran. No, sir, it is not. He came in around Easter time with a little bottle of perfume that he gave me, that I thought was, well, a damn nice thing for anybody to do. There was a stir, and a squat, sullen-looking Puerto Rican was brought in. He was Louis Weber. Then a husky fireman came in and sat down beside Moran. He had been assigned as receptionist outside Moran's office. He identified Weber and declared nervously but positively that Weber had visited Moran about fifty times. Moran swung around and glared I fireman for a long moment of silence. Ridiculous, he snapped. Pushing at the crowd around him, he demanded, Can I get the hell out of here? He could, with a possible charge of perjury hovering over his head. This week, Ambassador Bill O'Dwyer faced the senators. Extra chairs had been dragged in, standees crowded around the witness table. I need those mics to talk to the people, said O'Dwyer. Twiddling a paperclip, he rambled over an account of his whole career. I took 190,000 people out of the slums, soliloquized at length that crime was bred by prohibition mint machines and tattered nerves, washline disputes and arguments over children. O'Dwyer admitted that he had visited Costello's apartment as an army investigator, that he saw two Tammany leaders there. Senator Toby, who had been heckling O'Dwyer off and on all day, broke in. Snapped, Toby. It almost seems to me as though you should say unclean, unclean, as the old Romans practiced it, and that you would leave him alone, as they do a leper. O'Dwyer. You have bookmaking all over the country, even in New Hampshire. Thirty million dollars a year. Toby. We haven't a Costello in New Hampshire. O'Dwyer. Well, I wonder... I wonder who the bookmakers in Bretton Woods support for public office. Toby. Well, I will tell you one that they did not support, and he is talking to you now. O'Dwyer. And I can tell you that you don't know who supports you, because you sent here for money, to help you are your primaries and your election, and you got it, and you don't know where it came from. Toby, I didn't send to New York. O'Dwyer, you called up. Toby, well, I didn't get any. O'Dwyer, well, would you like to go into that? Toby, yes, I would, 
I challenge you. O'Dwyer. Oh, All right. Is there a Mr. Rosenblatt in the room? There was a moment of breathless silence. There was no answer. But after that, Senator Toby of New Hampshire was noticeably mum chance, and Ambassador O'Dwyer became noticeably self possessed. Negligently, he conceded that Costello undoubtedly had an influence with Tammany, but not with him, though he admitted that Costello's friend Irving Sherman had helped him in a mayoralty campaign. If there was corruption, M. his administration. Well, he had been deceived. Personally, he was against corruption. Bill O'Dwyer left the stand more composed than he mounted it. But the senators were not through. Frank Costello reappeared on the stand. His voice miraculously recovered. He began to tell all about the power he wields in Tammany Hall. And the senators were planning to have another go at O'Dwyer himself. While Frank faced mounting legal troubles, he navigated the perilous landscape with strategic finesse, buying time to confront the challenges that loomed on the horizon. In the arsenal of American democracy, few weapons are as potent as televised congressional hearings. Throughout the 20th century, three pivotal hearings left indelible marks on the nation, each wielding far-reaching consequences. The Army McCarthy hearings eradicated the looming threat of McCarthyism, a spectre some believed would linger indefinitely. The Watergate hearings, a defining moment in the history of American governance, reshaped the delicate balance between Congress and the presidency. The constitutional questions they sparked are destined to shape the political landscape for decades to come. However, it was the Kefauver hearings that had an immediate and lasting impact, felt nationwide. These hearings served as a powerful deterrent to underworld leaders, putting a halt to their various illicit activities, including the proliferation of gambling casinos and the influx of mafia figures into communities across the United States. The enduring influence of the Kefauver hearings lay in their unmasking of organized crime as a harsh reality, dispelling its mythic allure. The public witnessed criminal leaders invoking the Fifth Amendment or facing legal jeopardy, as exemplified by Costello's troubles when he chose to cooperate. The veil concealing the old order was lifted, and in the ensuing years, many of its members met their demise or were ousted from power under the relentless scrutiny the hearings had cast upon them. The emergence of new leaders lacked the prestige, power and experience of their predecessors. Politicians who once sought approval from figures like Frank before elections now hesitated. Investigative government agencies intensified their efforts to dismantle organised crime. Frank Costello found himself marked for destruction, trapped between two formidable forces. Government investigators delving into his affairs and ambitious underworld leaders aiming to supplant him. On October 4, 1951, the sun dipped low as Willie Moretti guided his sleek white Cadillac convertible toward Joe's elbow room. A nondescript bar nestled at 739 Palisades Avenue, just across the Hudson River, from the towering skyline of Manhattan. Restlessness had been gnawing at Willie. The hideouts out west, courtesy of directives from Costello, had worn thin. Hiding, the seasoned mobster mused, was beneath him. Frank, in a recent spat, had urged him to vanish again, but Willie, defiant as ever, rebuffed the suggestion. He could fend for himself. Awaiting him on the sidewalk was Vince, a man with a proposition promising respite from the heat, a chance for Willie to linger in the east. A firm handshake and a jovial backslap greeted Willie. Vince, ever casual, remarked, Hey Willie, you look good. In response, Willie quipped, Yeah. I got nothing but tan sitting out in the sun, thanks to Frank. Together they entered the cool refuge of the restaurant, where only three of Vince's associates occupied a table, expectant. Vince introduced his friends, and Dorothy Novak, the waitress, approached. Get us some menus, baby, Vince requested, flashing a grin. The waitress complied, disappearing behind the swinging doors to fetch silverware and menus, in the blink of an eye, the scene turned grim. At the precise moment, Willie's red tie leaped into view as the man beside him yanked it, forcefully pulling him back in the chair. Vince's friend brandished a .38, pointing it at Willie's head. 
a desperate lunge to the left proved futile. Gunshots echoed in rapid succession, ending Willy Moretti's reign. His lifeless form sprawled on the floor, blood streaming from chest and head, a gruesome tableau pointing toward the exit. The underworld resonated with the violent proclamation of Willy's demise, a clear message that Frank's protective mantle had been shattered. Willy's wisecracks and his guardianship under Frank Costello were silenced forever. In the wake of this brutal hit, Frank recognized the impending threat to his kingdom. Before this event took place, Carlo Gambino delivered a message to Luciano regarding the health of Willy Moretti. Luciano instructed Gambino not to resort to killing Moretti, but instead to seek out one of the best doctors, rather than Gambino's preferred bullet hole specialists. However, it remains uncertain whether Gambino made genuine efforts to spare Moretti. Moretti's continued presence in public posed a threat to the outfit, compelling Gambino to act decisively to assure his men of his leadership capabilities. Gambino, devoid of any familial allegiance to Moretti unlike Costello, perceived Luciano's directive as a sign of weakness. Moreover, Luciano's changing outlook, influenced by his wife, regarding criminal activities in New York City, added to Gambino's resolve to resolve the Moretti situation. Consequently, Moretti was eliminated, marking the beginning of a new era, with the assassination of another mob boss. <laughs>